record here. There we go. So good afternoon. I'm Julie Broadway, president of the American Horse Council. Uh, we're having a lovely spring day here in DC, it feels like. Uh, and so I'm, I'm lamenting a little bit that I'd like to be outside and doing what Sarah was suggesting was hearing this in the great outdoors around some horses, but not, not an option uh, really right now. Uh, but we're delighted that Sarah's with us this afternoon and I've got her book and she's going to probably talk about her book and where to buy her book. <laughs> and um, I have a clipping, if you can see that, from the Washington Post, which did a review of her book and they titled it, Why Horses Inspire Such Exhilaration, Delight and Love. And they gave Sarah lots and lots of kudos for a great book. So we're delighted to have her with us. I've got one or two more people that are trying to get in the room, Sarah, and then I'm going to pass the baton to you and let you get started. But why don't you take, you know, 30 seconds to give a, a brief background while we're waiting for everybody else to join. Tell us a little bit about yourself. We know you're an award-winning New York Times mm -hmm. author. What else <laughs> should we know about? And a, and a horse lover. So um, I, I'm a staff reporter for the New York Times. I actually began at the Times as their party reporter. I covered uh, 252 parties in 18 months. Um, and I was very concerned that I would be uh, pigeonholed as kind of, you know, a blonde floozy, because I don't know, I look like a blonde floozy, um, by uh, having that job. And the editor who hired me said, you know, Sarah, if you can do one hard thing well, you can do another hard thing well. I think that also is a life lesson for working with horses. You know, if you can uh, handle a horse with grace and ability uh, on the ground, you know, chances are that horse, it, it, or get it to a point where you can handle on the ground, that horse is going to excel in, in other disciplines and, and other things. So it was such a life lesson for me. She said, doing this well is hard. And if you can do one hard thing well, you can do another. So it's such a, a lesson not to limit myself. Um, and I've since become an investigative reporter. Um, I was a finalist for the 2016 Pulitzer Prize. Um, I cover uh, social unrest, uh, the Trump administration, uh, still more parties. Um, so it, it, it's been a really wide ranging. I was the West Africa uh, temporary bureau chief over there uh, for the Times. So it's been a, a, a wild ride. Um, but my secret, Julie, is that everywhere I go for the New York Times reporting their stories, when I'm done, I whip out another notebook and I go find the horses. <laughs> That's great. That's great. That has been my lifelong secret that um, I ended up outing myself in the book because uh, I never revealed that I was a horse crazy or even connected to horses at all um, my whole career. Well, well. So um, we are just so excited about having you with us. So our format for today is Sarah's going to just take control and she's going to speak for probably about, I don't know, 20 or 25 minutes and then we're going to have some Q&A. If, if you're like me, you've done a lot of Zoom, so you know where the controls are, you know where the chat feature is. So if you've got something, go ahead, go ahead and throw it in the chat and we'll try to keep our eye on that so we can come back around and make sure we, we address everybody's questions. But I think this is going to be in, entertaining. I think it's going to be educational and we're just excited about having Sarah share her, her life experiences with horses. So let me see, go over here to Sarah and I'm gonna say, make you the host. Ooh, there you go. So if you've got slides you want to show or whatever, feel free. I, I don't have slides, though. I probably could show some horse pictures like we all show our baby pictures whenever we meet people. But I thought I would start with uh, a, a little tiny reading from the book, um, which sort of explains what I was just saying um, about never outing myself. Um, in the decade I've worked for the New York Times, I've reported across the country and around the world. And as soon as I file each story, I do one thing before I head home. I search for the horses. The rider in me wants to gaze at them, to stroke them, to gallop with them. But the reporter has only one goal, to know their stories. And so I found myself notebook in hand, interviewing the keepers of the street horses of Senegal, West Africa, as the animals slept in corrals of parked cars. I've traced the Viking history of the canny Norwegian fjord horse who extracted us both from a peat bog in the Scottish Highlands. And I've quizzed Indian soldiers about the indigenous battle horses I charged through a quarry in Rajasthan. For my entire life, I've sought out horses endlessly, even in the urban world in which I grew up. As a girl, I found them hidden between the townhouses of Manhattan's Upper West Side, 
underneath the Robert F. Kennedy Bridge in Harlem and stampeding in Central Park, where I was a mounted parks enforcement officer as a teenager. And yet, I never asked myself, why do I love horses? That's because the answer has always been, because horses answer enough. And while to me, horses feel like an inevitability, a part of my body and life in a way I don't question any more than I would the rise and fall of my own chest, the reporter in me is plagued and by and duty bound to ask. In fact, why is the sum total of my job description? So it's only a matter of time before I turn that query on myself. That quest became this book. And I realized that I've been having a conversation with horses my whole life about exactly this question. Here, I'll tell you what I've heard. And so that's the thrust of Horse Crazy. And when I first pitched it um, to Simon and Schuster, actually, they came to me after I did a big investigation into New York City nail salons, uh, the one I was mentioning that was uh, a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. And they were like, do you want to write a book about nail salons? And I was like, uh, the, the nail salon story was about labor exploitation and health effects that manicurists face, a very, um, really crushing uh, and, and destructive industry. Um, and I was like, that's too sad. I don't want to write a, spend a whole year of my life. I already did a year of my life. Like, I can't. And they were like, well, what do you want to write about? And I was like, ponies. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't think it was what they were expecting. Um, and I had never really uh, expressed that part of my life. You know, I never revealed that, you know, before I would go to the office, I was uh, riding at five in the morning uh, every day out in New Jersey. Um, and uh, the reason why is I was afraid that if I reveal that so much of my soul was consumed with horses, um, I wouldn't be taken seriously. Uh, that I cover such hard facets of the world and, and horses are you know, tied up with uh, the trappings of the elite uh, in many ways. And I didn't want to be seen as out of touch. And then I was speaking to a friend and I, I expressed this predicament and he said, you know, Sarah, passion translates. That's the only thing that people uh, need to resonate with writing, with the work, with whatever you do is passion. Um, and whatever it is. And are you passionate about it? And the answer is hell yes. Um, and uh, uh, that's all you need. And so that kind of launched my coming out as a horse person. And I've actually ended up leveraging my interest with horses into my investigative career in the last couple of years. Um, you may be familiar with uh, icons of the sport, uh, Jimmy Williams and George Morris. Um, and actually I, uh, led the charge on some big investigations uh, after a Chronicle of the Horse, a horse publication looked into Jimmy Williams, um, I uncovered a, a, a lifetime of predation on young girls um, and exposed that in the Times. And that led me to my investigation of George Morris, who was a, a huge figure in the equestrian world. I'm sure you all know who Morris is. Um, and there had always been whispers of his uh, sexual assault and uh, rape of young boys. Um, and my investigation led to his being barred for life from the sport for credible allegations of that. And uh, some people ask me, you know, why have you dug into the ugly stuff in the sport? You know, don't you love this sport? How could you expose it? And the reason is because I love it. Um, it, it, I love it enough to insist it be better. And I, I think the Horse Council is, is on, on board with the same stuff in, in its work, that we love it enough to demand um, it be better in all arenas. Um, anyway, but all the while I have been collecting these stories of horses. And in the book, I initially pitched it as, this isn't my story, this is a compendium of horse stories. And they pushed back and they said, no, 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 we're, we're pretty sure it's your story. Um, which as a reporter, we have the word I beaten out of us. I mean, I never write about myself. It's like criminal, you know, I don't even, I, I, I have, I'm not allowed to um, make any political contributions. I'm not allowed to talk about my politics publicly. I'm not allowed to infuse any story I write um, as a New York Times reporter. And I realized that, you know, when you look at a dog or a cat, you have a kind of reaction to them, right? Like, oh, how cute. But when you look at a horse, you have an emotional reaction. It's something more like looking at a mountain vista or the sea rolling in. You know, horses do something to your soul. And then I realized that that meant horses are deeply personal, that they pull on your soul in a way that, that few other things can. And so the story ended up incorporating a lot more memoir than I thought it would. Um, part of my story with horses I tried to examine is why was I so drawn to them? Here I am, I'm from Manhattan. 
you know, that's not a horse country. I'm sure all of y'all are from places where at least you can find a horse if you look hard enough, you know, they're like, maybe you can go to a pub with, like I said, the White Horse Tavern named after a horse in New York. Um, then why was I so drawn to them? And I think a large part of that that I examine in the book is that I'm the daughter of an immigrant, of a Holocaust survivor. And my dad, the way uh, he, he was quite elderly when I was born, and the way he survived um, the, the Nazis was by having a false identity. He had a fake baptismal certificate. Uh, and that, that was how he survived. He almost hid in plain sight, you could say. And I realized that in inserting myself in this sport that is so bound up with Americana and um, with the elite, in a way I was insisting that I was part of America. That here my father had to pretend he wasn't who he was in order to survive. And here if I cloaked myself in this world, maybe I could survive and thrive. And I often say that people are gonna pick up, pick up this book about horses and be like, why is there so much Holocaust in this book about horses? <laughs> Um, and that's because that's my story. As weird as it is, uh, it, they're braided together. Um, and I would always say to my dad, you know, this isn't my world. This is Ralph Lauren's world. You know, he, he invented what we, the conceit of, of the uh, equestrian sport, the cashmere and the jodhpurs. And my dad would say, Sarah, not Ralph Lauren, Ralphie Lifshitz. Uh, Ralph Lauren's real name is Ralphie Lifshitz. He's a Jew from Queens, just like me. And um, that really spoke to me in that identity is what you make it. Um, and I, identity is uh, something you define yourself. No one else um, has the right to give it to you. And that led in my book to the exploration of black cowboys. I worked for a black cowboy in Harlem, um, Dr. Blair and Mrs. Blair. Don't you call him by anything other than Dr. Blair. Uh, he's a very tough cookie. And uh, I was bicycling along the Harlem River when I was a teenager and saw what I thought was a mirage in the river. And it was a barn in Harlem on a little island. And I biked across the way and out popped a head from the stall of this surly woman. And she said, if you can pick a stall, you can pet these horses. Um, and I, that began my job working for the Blairs. And the Blairs were, were black cowboys and we didn't teach riding on the island. We had inner city kids come, groups of 40, we had three horses, and we'd uh, let them watch me ride and, and talk about horses. I said to Dr. Blair one day, I said, this place is called New York City Riding Academy. You know, permission to speak freely, sir. Um, we don't teach riding. You know, what are we teaching here? And Dr. Blair said to me, um, Sarah, do you know what a cowboy is? And I was like, of course, who doesn't know what, like, he said, a cowboy is a black man. And Dr. Blair was uh, a historian and many historians have uh, deduced that one in four cowboys were black in the American pioneer era. And they have been entirely erased from the American origin narrative by the silver screen, by John Wayne, where you don't see a single black face on those screens um, and uh, by racism. And Dr. Blair even believed that the word cowboy indicated the blackness of the people who originally had that job. It's a, a, a school of thought that you wouldn't have called a white man boy in that time. You had a house boy uh, and that was a, a slave. Um, and boy was a pejorative. So the very fact you would have called him a cattleman or a rancher, the very fact that cowboy is the term um, seems to indicate to some historians that uh, they were black men who originally held that job, or pioneered that job. And I said to Dr. Blair, what are we teaching? And he said, we are teaching students that there are other lives out there and that they belong to the story of America. And he said, we are not teaching these people to ride, we are teaching them to dream. And it really resonated with me. And in the book, I went and rode um, in the American West with uh, a postman, Larry Callis, so one of my favorite humans, who has spent his life savings in creating a museum of the black cowboy. Uh, and uh, he didn't even know that his people and, and uh, that he was part of the American origin narrative. And as the great historian William Lauren Katz says, um, if black people came into that part of the narrative, they came at the end of a whip and in chains, and that's not the America we wanted to remember. And if the cowboy is meant to represent the best of us, uh, we can't remember that part of it. And so they've been erased. Um, 
But what really spoke to me about these different facets of identity and digging into my own and other people and who do horses belong to is that the horses don't give a shit. And I am in California because I've been working with Monty Roberts um, on a new project with him, the great man who listens to horses. Uh, he's actually uh, in my book. And in my book, he says the one thing that horses demand of us is that we are their safe place to be. That's it. They don't demand that you wear cashmere. Uh, they don't demand that you're black or white, um, or rich or poor. They demand that you are a safe place to be. As a prey creature, it's our obligation to them to be their safe place to be. And I ended up speaking to Monty Roberts um, about a time in my life in, that I chronicle in the book when uh, I became a prey creature, uh, much like the horses 24 seven. Um, I was in my apartment in New York and a man climbed in my window and stabbed me while I was sleeping. Um, he was attempting to rob me. And um, apparently in those situations, you usually die, the police said. Um, but fortunately um, I gave him uh, uh, what he needed, uh, all my stuff, and he actually left. Um, I didn't even realize I was stabbed until he left because the adrenaline was pumping so much. And after that, I suffered a type of post-traumatic stress disorder called hypervigilance, where I heard everything. And in order to get through life, you have to be able to tune out much of the world. The truck passing you, the air conditioner buzzing on the side of the building. Um, but when you're listening for a predator, you can't tune anything out. And the world became incredibly loud. And so I spoke to Monty Roberts um, about that state of being, um, because that's how horses live. And in recovering, I found a way to quiet down the world through horses who only communicate with silence, right? We rub up on them and we mutter to them and whatnot. And in the movies, they whinny back at you. But we all know that they really communicate with a sign language of gestures. Uh, Monty calls it equus. And one of the revelatory things, uh, what really part of what got me through it was I realized that the one distinction, although I had been transformed into a prey creature, you know, unlike a foal, um, I have a choice. And that choice isn't necessarily one that will be made for me by a stranger in the dark. Um, and I can choose whether or not to live as a prey creature. Um, and so horses throughout my life have buoyed me on their backs in astounding ways um, from teaching me that the world is far different than I ever imagined uh, as with the black cowboys um, to being my personal strength. And many people refer to the relationship with a horse as a dance you know, as, as, a, as a tango. Uh, and I think that's totally incorrect because a, the, a dance is two creatures who join in and participate um, with uh, equal intention. They're both there for the same reasons. And the truth is that the horse is uh, bred and, uh, to capitulate, right? One of us is in it for different, we're both in it for different reasons. And yet they've been bred for millennia to be a perfect complement to us. And I think it, is our obligation to constantly remember that a horse isn't created for itself, that a horse at this point has been uh, a construct created for people. And that means we owe it an ethic of extreme care. Um, and, and we have a, a tremendous obligation uh, to them. And I don't think we ever uh, pay it back, but places like the Horse Council and, and people like you, I imagine are uh, all trying in our, our different ways. Um, and one of the other really exciting things about the book so I went into the personal, was also using my personal experience as the backbone to tell the story of horses generally. So I took every little nugget in my life and went to the logical extreme and tried to figure it out. So I have a Dutch warm blood called Trendsetter. And I was like, how the hell do I have a Dutch horse in New York City? Like, that doesn't even make sense. Um, and so I ended up flying uh, with a trio of Dutch warm bloods in the belly of a 747, uh, importing them from the Netherlands, trying to figure out you know, how, how this mechanism uh, works. Um, I will tell you it works because of one sole thing, which is hay. If a horse is munching on hay, that horse is happy, whether you're flying above the Atlantic or landing on the tarmac at Schiphol Airport in Amsterdam. Um, and I ended up speaking to scientists about why horses constantly ruminate. Uh, what, what is so compelling about hay? I mean, it looks like 
garbage to me. Everyone's tried to chew a bit of hay. Um, it, it's, it's awful. Um, but horses lack an apostat. They don't have the ability to feel full. They actually spend 16 hours a day eating, according to scientists at Rutgers University who put little trackers on their jaws to see how often they were chewing. Um, and uh, is it an evolutionary advantage uh, to just always be snacking in case you run out of snacks? Or is it a disadvantage that now that they're stalled creatures, they're prone to colic? So I really pulled the logic thread of every single thing I did. And I'll end with one final story. And I would love to have questions because as a journalist, I ask so many questions. I'd love to be asked some questions. <laughs> I, put, I invite you all to put on your little journalism hat, which is I went riding in India and I rode a rare horse called a Marwari. It's actually the horse that's on the cover. Um, and if you can see, it has little ears that point in at the top of its head and make a heart. And it is so darling. It is just the most darling horse, plus being fleet like a thoroughbred and, and hot like an Arabian and, and bone like a warm blood. And it's just an awesome horse. So of course I get home from Rajasthan. I'm like, I have to have a more warrior horse. I just need a horse that has heart-shaped ears on the top of its head. Who doesn't? Turns out you can't export them. The Indian government considers them a rare commodity and has banned the export of them because their fear it will be depleted. And yet one woman I found on Martha's Vineyard has 12. And I was like, how the heck does this one woman have an island of these rare Indian horses? So I actually went uh, and spent a weekend with her, um, Francesca Kelly. Uh, she's glamorous, she's a bitch, um, and no one gets in her way, not even the government or the USDA because she got a couple out before the ban and she has been, drum roll, I'm revealing a little bit of a, of a spoiler alert in the book, smuggling Marwari semen to America and creating an illicit herd on her island. Um, but the truth is, you know, she's a horse crazy. The book about, could be only about her, right? Um, I think we all have a touch of that in us. I think uh, uh, the horse does something to the soul um, that makes that seem not that crazy. Um, but uh, ultimately, Francesca, Allison, should I reveal why Francesca did it? Is it too much of a spoiler? I don't think so, because there's so much in that one chapter that is jaw dropping that, <laughs> no, I think you should go ahead. <laughs> okay. Um, the truth is, the reason why Francesca has been traveling for two decades back and forth to India, buying horses, cultivating a stud book over there, throwing Marwari events to bolster the breed in the, in the Indian government's eye, they think of it as a native cur really, um, has not been for the horses at all, but for the love of the safari guide on her first trip across Rajasthan 20 years ago. And theirs has been an international affair mixed in with equine semen smuggling, horse trials, endurance riding, Indian dressage. And the truth was revealed there in her living room in Martha's Vineyard. And she said to me, is the story about horses? Yes, but isn't it always so much more than about horses? And that's really, could be the thesis statement of horse crazy and of me, and I imagine of all of you. Questions? <laughs> Thank you. you. <laughs> okay, guys, questions for Sarah? Anybody want to start us off? Hi, this is Cliff Williamson, and uh, I really enjoyed your book. Thank you. Um, I've, I wondered, though, like, I mean, I, it's interesting to hear you already started on the next big project, but uh, you talk about all the kind of international stuff you've done. What domestically kind of struck your fancy you talk about all the riding that you did personally but I mean big horse events are you a Kentucky Derby fan do you go to rodeos what else do you get into yeah good good question for the American Horse Council of course um look uh, um if other places around the world um maybe invented the horse right the horses were extinct in America 10,000 years ago they went extinct and were only reintroduced uh to this country by Spanish conquistadors which is really hard to believe because we think of them so intrinsically wrapped up with America's soul um then America perfected them and uh, in, inhabited them. Um, and so I, I think there's nothing like uh, what we have in America in terms of, of horse sport. Um, 
you know, I, I, I was spending uh, the weekend with Monty Roberts uh, watching Rodeo. I mean, there, there's just nothing like Rodeo in the world. Um, and uh, the, the level of uh, connection between uh, the cutting horse and, and the reined cow horse and the rider, um, I, I think can't even be replicated, maybe I'm biased, in a, a dressage arena in, in Frankfurt. Um, and uh, my brother actually, uh, for some reason, my family hates animals unless they're uh, covered in Bernays sauce. Um, and my brother ended up uh, buying on a whim a, a part share in a racehorse that went to the Derby. Um, and it was called Master David. Um, and uh, we went and watched Master David and my brother had what's called Derby fever, which is the uh, belief, you know, conviction that uh, every other horse in the Derby is a nag and yours is superior. And his Derby fever broke immediately when Master David came in second to dead last by 12 lengths. <laughs> um, but I think something really interesting happening domestically has been the, uh, the Retired Racehorse Project and um, taking losers like Master David <laughs> uh, and giving them a uh, second life. So I think that that's fascinating. And I don't see that happening um, in the UK. Uh, to the same degree it is here with their racehorses or in Dubai or Australia. Um, so that is really inspiring on the domestic landscape. Uh, from Vanessa, are there any cultural perceptions that took you by surprise regarding horses during your international travels? I've never got that question. It's an excellent question. Um, I'll go back to the Marwari chapter. Um, in India, uh, the right to possess, breed, even touch those horses um, has been uh, followed, the cat, followed the caste system, which is a social system that says uh, you're born into a specific strata of society. It was banned in the 50s, uh, Gandhi had it uh, constitutionally banned, um, and yet it pervades still. Um, and the bottom of that rung, the untouchables known as Dalits are considered just human filth uh, for, for no other reason than how they were born. And they are forbidden to touch horses. And one of the life rights of the higher caste, you've seen Indian weddings, right? The, the Bharat, it's that awesome parade of the groom to pick up his bride on a beautiful horse. And that is just, you know, the trope of an Indian wedding. Um, you know, it's, it's the you may kiss the bride, it's the chuppah, you know, and uh, Dalits are forbidden to do it. And there has been a group of uh, Dalits uh, activists who are riding to their weddings. And when they ride to their weddings, they're stoned um, by people. And there have been um, injuries, there's been some deaths, and they've, uh, they're wearing like motorcycle, not motorcycle, football gear now to do it. Um, and one Dalit petition with the high court, their Supreme Court, um, for the right to ride to his wedding. Um, and he, he never stopped fighting. And, and in the book, I described the scene when he finally rode to his wedding and looked, saw his bride for the first time through the magic ears of a Marwari horse. Uh, so yeah, that was a fascinating cultural perception. Um, oh, this is just a nice compliment from Megan the Ninja, thanks. Uh, she says, talk about different experiences to write about something you're connected to, too. You're awesome. Well, it's super interesting, Megan. You know, as a journalist, we parachute into uh, totally new scenarios. You know, I, I joke that it's the best job in the world because I'm a professional busybody because I get to ask all the questions we always want to ask. Um, and so there's the risk of when you write about something you really know in your bones and blood. I mean, I've been writing since I'm two. I've, uh, you know, engaged in it in a really deep way. Um, to overlook things and to um, to make assumptions, you know, but then I, I, I really tried to fight myself on that. So in the very beginning of the book, I talk about the hand system of measurement. You know, I haven't given too much thought. 14.2 is a pony. Above that is a, a bigger a cob. You know, but what the heck is a hand? Um, and it turns out it's a unit of measurement uh, uh, established in ancient Egypt. And actually they found the, a cubit rod in a cent millennia old um, tomb that gives the initial measurement of the hand and it's actually a hieroglyph of a little hand like this with the four fingers of hand. You know, so I pushed myself to, so um, I pushed myself to, oh, I had an echo of myself, I'm sorry. I, I pushed myself to, to uh, not take anything I pushed myself to, to uh, not take anything. Are you guys hearing an echo of me too? Hmm. Hmm. Okay. 
Yeah, there is one. If if everybody that's not speaking could meet their line, that'd be appreciated. So Sarah, you know, so Sarah, what we do here at the Woods Council um, is about legislation. And there's a new piece of legislation that's going through called the Whole Veterans Act, which is going to be um, analyzing the effectiveness of the use of horses for veterans who uh -huh. have mental challenges. So given your experience with PTSD, tell me a little bit about how you how you leveraged horses to help you overcome that you know that experience sure and actually when i was at uh flags up farm monty roberts ranch he was doing um a program called horse sense and healing which was with veterans and they've done uh through the flags up uh, in collaboration with scientists some um scientific studies to look at the effectiveness because you know it's all well and good to say it gives you a warm and fuzzy but i think you need data to back it up um and and theirs has shown um, some pretty interesting results on the well-being uh, of veterans. Um, I am on the board of a therapeutic riding organization in New York City, believe it or not, um, you wouldn't expect one to find one there, called Gallup NYC, which does 500 riding lessons for, uh, um, a week for a disabled adults and children and also veterans. Um, and we had an event uh, we called our barn dance back when we could have things like dances, the last one. And um, one of our veterans asked if she could present her uh, trainer with an award. The trainer was getting the year end award. She said, can I present it to her? And we said, okay, sure. It's unusual, but okay. And she arrived and she got on stage in her full military dress. Oh, I get emotional talking about it. And she said, you know, I'm supposed to present this award to you, but I want to present you with something else. And she took the pin off her uniform for serving uh, in Afghanistan and pinned it to her trainer and said, uh, you helped me come back from the war. And, you know, I, I just, uh, you know, look, I think we need acts like you're getting behind in order to understand the science behind it and to become you know, uh, uh, more conversant in what it actually does to the brain and the body physiology, but you can tell pretty transparently what it does to the soul. And if, um, I think someone called in. And so I just want to say, if you're not able to, to view the chat, uh, Debbie posted a really nice thing that says that if you have any interest in the science trial results, you can write to her at Debbie at MontyRoberts.com and she'll share that with you. So cool. Other questions for Sarah? I have a question. Hi, Victoria, go Hi. ahead. So um in the beginning of your um like in the beginning of the webinar, you spoke about the disconnect between like black cowboys and like equine history and culture and stuff like that. Um I mean, in recent times, I, like since I've been on social media working for the um, American Horse Council, I've seen a really big emergence of kind of throwing them like black cowboys into mainstream media. Um, you know, Netflix is coming out with a new series with like Idris Elba um, featuring like a black cowboy story. I think it's based off of somewhere in like Philadelphia or something. Um, the Compton Cowboys are huge, um, like the Urban Cowgirls are huge. How do you think that will translate into like the grand scheme of like, like horse culture in general? Like, you know, we have, I mean, this industry is pretty, you know, it's either, you know, you're at the top or, you know, you're, you're just, you know, a little barn that's like, you know, doing what you need to do. Um, so how do you think that'll like translate into like the grand scheme of things? And like, do you think that it'll really change like attitudes, you know, you're out there, you're seeing things, um, yeah, like well, on the ground, you know? So look, it's very, very important that we make sure it's not trending. Mm -hmm. And, and that, that's the essential thing. And one of the reasons why, you know, I, I wrote the book a year ago, mm -hmm. it's like, a, I, I joke that my book's the first woke horse book. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like it, it, it predates it, uh, the, the movement towards it, which I applaud. But, um, you know, the one of the problems with the black cowboy is that it's a major look moment. It's wait, a black cowboy? And we need to get to the point where you don't turn your neck and go, oh, a black cowboy. Um, yeah, and totally. that, I, 
Yeah, and that I think is the goal, you know, uh, or, or a, an Asian equestrian, mm -hmm. you know, or, or um, a, a transgender equestrian. Right. You know, we need to get to the point where it's it's not a, um, a, a like Ralph Lauren uh, currently used one of the black cowboys in their catalog. Um, forget his name. I follow him on Instagram. He's really handsome, um, and uh, uh, you know, it, it, we it needs to we need to work for it to be a point where it's not a, an anomaly. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason I felt so passionate about including my book is the they were there, they've always been there. And it, it, they've been written out of the story uh, by racism uh, um, because his, history is written by the victors and the victors mm -hmm. of the, that story were white. Um, and I hope it changes the industry, but we have to really fight for it not to be trendy. We have to have meaningful scholarships uh, of inclusion. You know, there was a, a eventing did a scholarship that looked great, it was $5,000 and they split it uh, between over 40 people, I believe, or maybe it was 30 something and that's meaningless. That gets you, uh, you know, half a show fee. You know, th that looks good, but that's not gonna put hay in your horse's stall. Um, so uh, we need to, to make meaningful change and I, I'm sure you guys are kicking butt on that. Mm -hmm. um, so you have another question on Debbie, you see at the bottom there? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, yeah, I, I, I think um, keep people horses relevant. Uh, it's very important to um, me to realize that the trappings of the elite, the, the stuff that made me feel so othered in equestrian sport are not horses. That uh, they've been trussed up in stuff that doesn't belong to them. That they are incognizant of wealth. They are incognizant, incognizant of stature. And I think when you strip that down and recognize, uh, you know, to quote Monty again, the horses demand that one thing of us that we're their safe place to be, there is increasing relevance. It, it's easy to dismiss it as like the fancy pants sport uh, of the elite. Um, but the truth is it's in Compton and it's in Philly um, and it's in ranches all over uh, the West. And, and I think horses are relevant if we enable more people to interact with them who can uh, then realize um, what they can do for your, your head and your heart. Far by, beyond putting rosettes on your wall. Do I have one or two more questions? I have one more question. Oh. If someone else has one, you can go. <laughs> Um, but so do you, how big of, um, so you've been around the world and like have seen different cultures, how big of a, I guess, cultural disconnect is there in like the States and like the equine industry with like people other than like your, you know, mainstream equestrians, if that makes sense. Like, how do you think people's cultures, like immigrants and stuff, like, I mean, I'm an Asian equestrian. Um, do you ever see like different like cultural reasons in behind like riding or like not riding or getting into horses? Um, yeah, I think uh, one of the conversations happening in the um, uh, at least the show jumping world is about uh, you know why are I think it's 97 members of the United States Equestrian Federation identify as black out of the hundreds of thousands they have, they just released. I mean, that's, that's wackadoodle, that's nuts. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, uh, the, the, some people say, oh, it's cause it's expensive, you know, and, and uh, uh, money in this country, unfortunately often falls on socioeconomic lines, uh, but there are plenty of rich black people, you know, where are they? Um, and I think that's the messaging of exclusion. Um, and I think it's on all of us who are interested in these topics um, to, to find uh, new ways to prevent there from being cultural divides um, because horses don't don't give a shit about what culture you come from. They just, you know, need you to be steady and warm and, and keep that hay coming. Um, I think Elizabeth has several questions. Yeah, I've got a few. And I'd like your contact information at the end. I work as a, both a journalist and a publicist, nice. particularly in the horse industry. And I have a per passion for film and entertainment. And we actually did a seminar on putting horses in the public eye a few months ago, thanks to Julie. Uh, I worked for the value at one time is the horse industry liaison, but Saturday I was on a panel. It was the Tom Bass seminar on uh, basically diversity in equestrian sports. And I sure wish you'd been on that uh, as I can say, and I certainly want to connect you with that. Uh, you're talking about a lot of things that I think are issues that we're all facing, particularly American horse councils had time to ride going on for a lot of years in terms of 
bringing new people into the sport and maybe by involving you in some of these things too and putting our heads together in these ways sure. uh, there are things that we can do that haven't been you know that are yet to be developed i'll put it that way hmm. and i'd like to write about you certainly for at least one of the outlets i write for cowboys oh, hello. sometimes and i think you know there's some way i can get in touch with you julie or through julie or something yeah. you're a good story my gosh <laughs> <laughs> just, yeah. I mean, how many times you know everything um not just your book but just talking about the life that you've lived and how horses have impacted you uh, and i think you're a good interview and for us to be able to what julie's done in bringing you here today is really giving us a chance to see somebody that's uh, putting horses on the public way that is really good for us and that's so what we can all jump on and then everybody in the horse industry can say hey come on over here Great. Yeah. Um, do you have a, a question though? I, we're gonna people are gonna get mad if we don't have a question. What's the question? Okay. How do you see uh, that the horse industry can put itself in the public eye more and bring mm. people into the sport? Yeah. Uh, you know, I, the sport? Getting involved in horses. I was yeah. in the public eye with horses in a very interesting way. I was a mounted parks enforcement officer in Central Park when I was a teenager, um, and uh, I was I was a bad student and I was a truant. But when I was on horseback, um, I was chasing truants back to school <laughs> and I didn't, chasing truants just like me. We weren't supposed to chase them, but we did. Uh, it was really fun. Um, and mostly putting, um, selling people to put their dogs back on their leashes. Uh, but what was really compelling about that was the awe that the horses inspired, that nobody could walk past without being struck. And we only needed two of them to keep essentially the whole park in line um, because they have such a commanding presence. Um, and, you know, there, there's so much, uh, uh, in, at least in my city, um, uh, mixed uh, thoughts about horses in urban areas. Uh, we have the carriage yeah. horse debacle um, going on right now. Um, and uh, you know, police horses, I guess, would be stabled in the city. But I, I think that bringing horses to places that are horseless, like Dr. Blair was doing on his island or bringing children there. Again, the point of horses is not to teach people how to ride horses to me. The point of horses is what he said, to teach people how to dream. Um, and I think we can't do enough uh, bringing people without access to horses to horses, not to ride, not to put jodfers on them necessarily, um, but to show them these formidable creatures and that there are other paths out there. Uh, when I'm at Gallup in uh, Queens, um, I uh, am always astounded that a, a tremendous number of the students are of color, because if you build it, they will come, if you make the pathways accessible. And it, even more so than that, I was there last weekend, and this has just blew my mind. I, I mentioned this um, this weekend as well. There was a girl, a 10-year-old girl on a horse, and she has, you know, uh, the uh, hippotherapy requires a side walker on each side to stabilize and then a, a, a lead walker and a trainer and she has four people around her, you know, all masked up for coronavirus, she's masked up. And then a fifth person was her father walking next to her with a shoulder bag carrying a mechanical respirator, a machine with a tube up to her throat from the ground to the horse that kept her breathing. And he was carrying her lungs with her. And if that child can feel the power and the gift of a horse, that child who can't even breathe on her own was striding across the paddock on a horse on her own. You know, that, that's the type of interactions that people far beyond horses can understand, people outside of our industry and world immediately get. Um, and, and that's more of what we need to show to the world. Bravo. <laughs> I'm just gonna build off something you said, Sarah, because um, traditionally each year, unfortunately wasn't possible during the pandemic, um, we've partnered with the United States Department of Agriculture. They have down on National Mall, they have a, um, a Friday a farmer's market mm -hmm. and we bring horses from um, the Quezon platoon and the mounted police here okay. um, and have horses out there during the market on one Friday uh, each year and for meet a horse day. And your point is well taken because people are here vacationing, they're walking up and down the mall, seeing the sights, and they look over and they see these horses standing there. And suddenly it's like a huge, wow, they just all turn and they just appear and they wanna have their picture made and they're so excited. And it's amazing when we talk to them, how few of them have actually had a personal experience with a horse. And so 
I think you're right in that having horses in urban settings um, is good for our industry because it really exposes people who would not otherwise have had that opportunity to see you know, how great they are and, and get excited about it. Exactly. Anybody else? Questions for Sarah? Um, Megan the Ninja asked me privately, she said, was it hard to find a publisher allowed you to write what you're passionate about? Uh, it really wasn't. Um, actually, Simon & Schuster bought this book uh, in a day. I sent them an email. I didn't even do a proposal. I sent them an email. Um, and I think that really speaks to the power of horses. You know, they, they knew that horses appeal in, in so many ways. Um, and uh, they were very, very open um, because, you know, the, like everybody, what are you going to buy someone who loves horses for Christmas? You know, a story of a horse or, you know, new spurs. So they, uh, they really um, felt uh, uh, it was a compelling story. So th that was really exciting. But I think if you're looking to write a book, even if it's not about horses, like what my friend told me, passion translates. And really that's what makes a good story. And when I look for stories about other people to write about, um, I wrote a story this past weekend about this phenomenon taking over New York City of beastly loud cars that people soup up their engines so they sound like gunshots and people in New York are furious about it. And I went to figure out, you know, uh, who are these people who are souping up their cars? And it, it turns out it's just a tremendous passion and it, it, it makes them feel larger than life and they don't have a lot of power right now because of the coronavirus and, and it's the one thing that uplifts them. Um, and so, you know, who thought I would ever care about these cars are actually, people call them um, fart cars because they make such a pow, 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 gross noise that people hate them. And who knew I would find, um, you know, deep passion and, and meaning uh, from people obsessed with these funky cars. Um, so passion translates. One last question. I'm, I'm curious to know if you've gotten a lot of response from people saying that they're buying your book for their non-horsey friends, because <laughs> I realize that that's what I've been doing. Oh, well, thank you so much. Um, I, uh, I, I have actually a, a tremendous amount of people and actually that Washington Post review was very, very gratifying because she said, um, you know, this isn't a book for people who necessarily love horses, which you would never expect a book called Horse Crazy um, that it, it could go beyond. Um, but, you know, Susan Orlean writes about orchid thieves. Uh, and I, I know I don't want an orchid. I don't want to steal an orchid, but I want to know everything about that orchid thief. Um, and so I, I think that um, the, the curious uh, can embrace this book. And maybe that's the answer, Julie, you know, to expanding the uh, field of horses, that it isn't really about horses. It's about this deep, rich history of how the United States was made, you know, on the back of a horse and, and, and where these creatures come from and what they've done for us and what they continue to do. And that can expand interest far beyond anyone who ever wanted to, you know, snuggle with a Shetland. Thanks, Sarah. Okay, guys, we're going to wrap up for today. Any of you want Sarah's contact information, just feel free to reach out to me and I'll, I'll, I'll hook you up so you can correspond with her directly. But we're delighted to have you, Sarah. We wish you the best of luck. Where can we buy the book at? Oh, great. So let me send you this. So if you would like an autographed copy, I have uh, collaborated with a local bookstore and um, it's right around the corner from me. So he calls me up and he says, Sarah, you got a bunch of books and I will autograph them for you. And you're also shopping small. Um, so that's a, a much better than making Jeff Bezos richer with Amazon. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to say is if you follow me on Instagram, uh, this is where you can find out more stuff. I also sent it to the chat, um, both of those. So uh, one is autographed copies and the other one is Horse Crazy the Book is my Instagram and um, you can have adventures with me. Oh, great. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks everyone for joining us this afternoon. Have a great day. Terrific, thank you to the right. council. I really thank you. appreciate it. Bye.